Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to MBR, or as we like to call it around here, Nothing But Rants, the show where I find topics that I'm oddly passionate about, and I pontificate upon them. These are not hot takes, but rather takes that I'm hot about. Shut up and grab some tape. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome in to the Film Guy Network on a fabulous Monday evening. As always, we have a loaded show for you guys tonight. Uh, man, it was a hectic weekend of college sports, or college football news, I should say. Um, I know there's a lot of college basketball going on right now. There's a lot of uh, uh, the best women's player in America is playing right about now. All that good stuff going on, but hey. We've got a bunch of football to talk about today. Um, I think you handled that echo just now, or you should have at least. So that should be good right there. Um, hey, how about them audio checks within like 30 seconds of the show? Good job on the uh, good job right there on the uh, on the chat side, and good job over there by our audio team. So welcome in. We got a great one for you. Um, I want to open tonight's show with my thoughts on capitalism. Look, I, I like capitalism. As someone who owns their own business, I like making money, okay? I like pursuing money. I like the thought of the pursuit of money. I like the idea that we live in a world where capitalism is good, or at least we live in a country where capitalism is allowed, right? You got dreams and aspirations. You got a good thought and a good business model. You can make yourself rich. You can absolutely go out here and do it in this country, um, and that is awesome, okay? I love capitalism. I do not like cash grab capitalism which I think is what we kind of got going on nowadays in college football, or at least the machine around college football. Um, I think cash, cash grab capitalism gets people hurt, um, especially around the sport of football. Um, we play a very violent sport. We play a very violent sport with a very short lifespan uh, in terms of your earning capabilities, right? Your, pre, or your peak earning years in this industry, in this sport, in this, uh, you know, uh, you know, lifespan, right? It's very, very short as a football player to make your money. So as athletes, you're always in kind of this balance, at least as good athletes. You're always in this really uh, difficult balance of, do I kind of risk the lifespan of my career, right? For the opportunity for an influx or a jolt rather in temporary earnings. Um, we see it a lot. We see this a lot nowadays, particularly with the world of name, image, and likeness coming around. Um, but the players, I think that's what you might think I'm talking about tonight. The players are not the ones that I'm always most concerned with, with regards to cash grab capitalism, finding its way into college sports, particularly college football recruiting. Um, it's the, it's the adults sometimes that I really get to worrying about that swooping in on this cash grab capitalism, a market that is available, right? It certainly applies to a lot of these businesses that I continuously see pop up around the, the world of college football, particularly the world of college football recruiting uh, and talent acquisitions like this one. The Prep Super League, the Preparatory Super League, last June, talked about this last summer, actually. Last June, Brian Woods, who is the uh, CEO of the Prep Super League, announced the beginning of this spring football league. Um, and I'm going to be honest with you, I'm going to read some of this stuff to you guys tonight because there are athletes, there are particularly young student athletes that listen to this show that I promise you have been propositioned by this company and I think it just be uh, behooves all of us to call this what it is, or at least to give you my thought process of this, and you can take with uh, the reporting what you what you see fit. But um, I'm not loving this. This reads, looks, and sounds like a terrible idea. Um, and to be honest with you, uh, it, it's a hope and a dream for uh, Mr. Brian Woods, I would imagine, to come up a, a nice little large sum of money for him when he ultimately sells the TV rights or streaming rights to whatever league he's trying to create off the backs of high school football players. Let me read some of this stuff to you. Okay, because this is a classic flippity-flop every single time. Every single thing I'm going to read to you today gets uh, kind of debunked by themselves or changed up on within its own article right here we go first our, our first portion of this i want to read to you because we do the reading around here so you don't have to this comes from an article from our guy becoming a friend of the show we talk about him a lot pete nakos over there and on three um quote plans are still in place for the prep super league to debut next month with the regular season opener scheduled for april 27th so we're about a month away from this spring football league starting since woods made the announcement some plans have changed 
That'll be a theme tonight. He anticipates 400 players to participate across 12 teams with three divisions. His goal is to eventually expand to 16 and then to expand to 30 teams. However, that would not mean 30 different markets. Okay, so here we go with the flippity flops, right? Might be 12. Maybe we'll go to 16. Maybe there'll be 30. Who knows? Bottom line, not a lot of hard, hard concrete planning here. I'm going to continue here. Since the launch announcement, there has been a resorting of location changes too. Plans were in place for Cleveland, but the state of Ohio has not altered its NIL policy. Instead, he sold a franchise to Denver. Nevada enacted language in August to allow NIL at the high school level, opening up the Las Vegas market. So now we're just trying to grab as many of these NIL available markets as we possibly can. All these cities are involved currently. Atlanta, which by the way, if you're, a, if you're a Georgia high school football player that's signed up for this, please let me know. I would love to know your name. I would love to know one of these 400 people that have signed up for this because it's crazy. Um, Dallas, Denver, Houston, New Jersey, New Orleans, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Miami, San Diego, San Francisco, and Tampa are apparently schools that have, you know, found their way into this. Um, and here's where the, the absolute just a spot cap when I start reading some of this stuff. Um, I've been very encouraged. This is, uh, this is Jones talking right here. I've been very encouraged by the number of four and five star kids. He recently told on three. We're up to around 100 four and five stars that have committed to play in it. And some of these kids are legit. Some of these kids are legit. They are some of the best kids in the country. Granted, we're not everywhere where these kids are. Arguably right now, the best recruit that signed up for this is Bryce Underwood up in Michigan. But as I just mentioned to you, they don't have a team in Michigan. So my man's plans apparently are to fly Bryce Underwood down to New Orleans where they have a team because he's committed to LSU, fly him down to New Orleans twice a week for practice and then fly him down again on Saturday for this game or whenever they play these games on the weekend. So that's the plan currently to take this high school football player and send him all the way down to New Orleans every weekend presumably paying him you would imagine definitely paying him um but it, it continues here man it continues on and on and on and on and on he said he got a hundred four and five stars right a hundred mm -hmm. of them legitimate these guys are legitimate well you know he provided a list he provided a list of 12 of these hundreds of four and five stars that he's got committed um the highest ranked com uh, com or com player committed to this is a 2025 cornerback named dorian brew out of california um they have a 2027 wide receiver signed up for this that's awesome a young freshman playing year-round football that's great. When PSL first launched, former FBS and NFL head coaches were the target to serve as head coaches. That is still in, still the case in some of the 12 markets. However, Woods has opened the pool to experience high school football coaches. Now, Brooks, this would be counterproductive to, to high school football, right? April 27th, most of these guys are in the middle of spring practice here in the state of Georgia. I don't know how it is everywhere else. I would imagine they're in similar time frames because the college football recruiting calendar is in a, a very stat or a very situated calendar, right? It's very uh, concrete. This is what we do every year. So everyone kind of nationwide schedules their programming around that. So we want to get some high school football coaches to volunteer for this super spring league with all these high school football players in the in the in the name of name, image, and likeness. All praise to thee, uh, name, image, and likeness. He continues, we have been engaging the top high school coaches in these markets because we want to be able to support traditional high school football. We're all about it. We want to be able to support it. There's goodwill. There's some goodwill to build by bringing in established coaches, ones that have been in their markets and, and been doing a lot of good for their players for many years to come. Uh, we are going to be announcing all of our head coaches in the next couple of weeks. All right. Hey, just trying to be trying to be an advocate of high school football everywhere right that's what we want to do we want to help out these high school football coaches and be a, a, a teammate during the spring send your guys to us we'll continue to cultivate all that coaching you do all, all the other times of the years right that's what we're talking about right except for florida and texas in florida and texas name image and likeness is not allowed to be done you are not allowed to be a high school athlete receiving payments from some outside business to play football. So they're not gonna allow you to do it and, and remain a high school athlete in the state of Florida or in the state of Texas. But hey, there's a caveat for that from Mr. Woods, who's all about high school football. Okay, here's the quote. Florida and Texas still prohibit name, image, and likeness, but Woods believes there is still a way for athletes in those states to profit. 
if a player in a state like Florida wants to participate in NIL with the Prep Super League and make that a senior season or forego remaining high school eligibility, then they will have every right to do so, and that will be an enticing option for them. So in one article or one paragraph, hey, all out here for the high school coaches. In another one, hey, Florida and Texas, we're going to pay you all to skip your senior year. It's all good. It's all fine and fine and dandy. Oh, by the way, they didn't say this in today's news article and news release, um, but there will be no insurance, zero insurance provided. You will have to provide your own health insurance. So good luck on that one. Hope you don't break a fib. You know, you're out there, break a fibula, miss a year and a half. Hopefully some janky Mexican doctor is not doing it on you because you ain't got health insurance to fix it. So, hey, boys and girls, if you're listening today, listen up. Whatever they're paying you, it is not enough. I'm going to tell you that right now. If they're paying you to play in this league, it is not enough. Ask for double. Okay, ask for double until they can find some Jimmys and Joes to just walk out there and play for free because they need some opportunity and some shine. But if you are a four and five star, stay the hell away. College football coaches don't need extra tape to evaluate. They got plenty to watch August through December. All right, so whew, can't believe people are signing up to do this, but apparently, uh, according to this man, signing up in droves, even though he only gave us 12 hmm. uh, of the of the signees. What, what are your thoughts, guys, before we welcome everybody into the show? What are your thoughts on this idea of a spring high school football league? Because to me, it sounds terrible. How the hell is a league like this going to make any revenue? That's the question, right? How, where's the revenue coming from? Where's the revenue come from? VCs, venture capitalists, and here's the here's the play. Okay, it goes on. That's why I do the reading for you guys. It's a great question. Here's why I do why I do the reading. There is a streaming software that they are debuting with this Super League, mm. and the streaming software is supposed to be uh, like ultra, like less than a second in delay. So it's a brand wow. new streaming company that is trying, to, I, I would imagine he's got thorough, thorough, deep investments in that streaming company as well, the owner of this league. And I'm sure he's probably just using this as a guinea pig. But in terms of who's investing in this, I don't know. I have no idea. I have no idea how they're going to pay these guys other than venture capitalists. VC money and angel donors come in, they see a, a company like this and he tells them, hey, I have a structure in place. Eventually, I will be able to sell this for the for the streaming rights or sell this for its bones and its structure for X amount of dollars and you'll get return on your investment. So what it sounds like to me is this guy's basically starting up this league to showcase whatever software he has in hopes that someone will eventually buy that. And then at that point, you can basically just blow up the league because you've now sold your software to a major distributor such as CBS or ESPN or something like that. Is that what it sounds like to you or am I just crazy? Well, let me read it to you right here. In his past ventures with the Spring League and USFL, Woods has found linear television options for those leagues. He's taking a different route with the PSL, opting to launch with direct-to-consumer app where fans can watch games in real time. The league has partnered with video streaming company 24i and real-time video streaming platform Phoenix. I guarantee you the play is subscription fees for these streaming mm, services. Of course. Oh. There's no way in hell that's a free Another streaming one. service. No. There's no way. So, yeah, they're, they're, he's trying to make this a revenue play in a variety of different ways while stealing from high school football programs through the nature of NIL. Yeah, and I mean, I, I hate to break it to you. I can't name a lot of people who are willing to fork up subscription money to watch high school football. As good, if, even if it is the supposed four and five star high school guy. Local high school football teams do this on uh, NF, NFHS, yeah. all right? The national football or national something. It's a national broadcasting service, but they do it because they have ties to the local hometown. Exactly. Right? The, the, the Atlanta Sky Force or whoever the hell this team starts up with, with a bunch of two and three stars that nobody outside of us has really ever heard of, they're not going to be streaming these games unless no. it's mom and pop wanting to watch it. So you're right. This doesn't. This feels like an unnecessary addition to high school football because we, like you mentioned, we already have everything that high school recruits or anybody needs to get your name out there. I mean, we got seven on seven leagues, spring football, all of college high school football these season. Kids, these kids play way too much football as is. Yeah, as is, they're playing too much football. They're around football way too often. I mean, high school kids nowadays, guys, if they're not running track, you know what their schedule looks like from July. At the end of July, they really start team camp. In August, they're in camp, right, mm -hmm. as school starts. Yeah. They play from late, mid-August to uh, all the way until November, sometimes into December, right? State championship games this year were on December 10th, all right? Mm -hmm. December 10th happens, and here in Atlanta, seven-on-seven -seven tryouts start right after Christmas. I shit you not. Yeah. They have 20 days to let their body just kind of relax, right? Offensive linemen, defensive linemen, y'all get to go do whatever the hell you want. But these skill guys – 
It's year freaking round. Year round they are doing this shit all the time. They play too much football as is. We're getting to the point now where Kirby Smart, Nick Saban, and all these great coaches are standing up in front of microphones and saying, please, please play other sports. Please play other sports because the last thing we want you to do is get here and get and be already burnt out on the model, let alone freaking hurt. Like, I, How many times do we have to know as football people that you only got so many bullets, man? You can only take so many hits in this sport. You can only do mm-hmm. so many. You can only tear up your knee so many times. So why would we expose ourselves? That's why I opened the discussion with this. As an athlete, you have to balance the the risk of, uh, you know, risking my, my lifespan of my physical career versus the shortcomings of immediate income. That is what you have to weigh the rest of your career, and it's starting earlier and earlier now for guys. All right, welcome to tonight's show. We got a great one for you. Stay away, young men, please. No offense to, to, to PSL. I just don't think it's a good idea. Um, we got a great one for you. USC is absolutely on fire. We got some details on that one. Uh, Dion Sanders making the show notes again today. Sorry, I'm sure you guys love that um, based off how you received the last one. Riley Leonard in today's show news. Um, Not necessarily too concerned, but I'm concerned. Okay, they aren't concerned. I'm a little bit concerned. Got some flags up there. Uh, Iowa, we're going to talk collectives out here making statements again tonight. And then some Big Ten coaching rankings came out, and we felt it necessary to talk to you guys about that. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button, like, subscribe, and rate and review them. We have a great one for you. Uh, But before we get too far into tonight's show, I want to go ahead and give a shout out to our friends over at prize picks if you have not already please sign up to prize picks today use promo code brooks you'll get a 100 percent deposit match what does that mean you put up to a hundred dollars you get a hundred dollars matched in your account instantly okay and there's some good stuff going on right now with march madness and and, and all the tournaments going on i believe last week they gave you caitlin clark at a half a point i think they're running that for the remainder of the tournament wow. if i remember correctly if they told me that correctly nonetheless you should check it out today prizepicks.com use promo code brooks um i got one for you terrence shannon at 21 and a half he's going over the guard from illinois he, he gonna score at least 22 points tonight book it it's a guaranteed lock. All you got to do is get two more of those, and you can get, what, 5X over there oh, on yeah. prizepicks.com. So I gave you one lock. Go find you two more and put it in over there at prizepicks.com using promo code Brooks. All right, let's talk about this USC stuff because, man, they were in the news this weekend. Five commitments on Sunday alone. I mean, we haven't seen a run like this in some time in the recruiting circuits, right? I, I haven't seen my rat-a-tat-tat like this. Five in one day? No, I can't think of the last time off the top of my head. I think, I mean, the only time I can remember is I think Florida did something very similar to yep. this last summer. Last class, that is right. They did a, uh, uh, they lost uh, the left-handed quarterback to Ole Miss, and Billy Napier was like, Bet we're going to get everybody to commit today. Um, so that's exactly right. That's a good call right there from Jay Will. But five commitments, most notably Justin Terry flipping from the University of Georgia, five-star defensive tackle. Isaiah Gibson, the five-star edge rusher out of Warner Robins. Gus Gordova, a defense lineman out of Texas who has a fan or is a fan of peanuts. Hilton Stubbs is a safety out of Florida. You looked at me weird like you don't know that story there, Curb. We'll get to it in a second. Dominic Kelly is a 2026 cornerback out of Florida. Everyone talking about the the five commitments. That's huge, right? Five commitments in one day. I think the bigger storyline here is that none of these five kids are California kids. All of these kids were out on a visit, an, an unofficial visit. So we are to presume they paid their way. Okay. All these cats drove or flew out to California this past weekend. Uh, Aaron Donald was in town, all the good stuff, and they end up popping commitments. But before we talk about what it requires to land these types of commits in one day, um, nowadays in 2025 recruitments and 2026 recruitments, before we talk about that, I want to talk about something that we've been asking from Lincoln forever on this channel. Since we've been talking about as a, as a trilogy here on this network, we've been talking about Lincoln and the word resources, right? And, man, has he dedicated enough to the defensive side of the football this offseason. And it starts with the staff overhaul, right? Fired Alex Grinch this offseason. Hired defensive coordinator Danton uh, D'Anton, excuse me, uh, Lynn, who is Anthony Lynn's son. Uh, he was the UCLA defensive coordinator. I don't know if y'all saw what UCLA defense did last year, but it wasn't just Latu. They were one of the best defenses in the country. So they hired a new defensive coordinator, and this man has gone out and made some serious, serious hires. They hired North Dakota State's head coach, who I believe had like a 90% winning percentage at North Dakota State as a head coach because everybody wins up there with the Bison. Matt Entz hired a head coach in D1AA going to be the linebackers coach out there at USC. Doug Belk is a defensive backs coach originally from Houston. 
I know the name because he is multiple times over interviewed for jobs at Georgia. He has been a name that has constantly popped up as, hey, look out, this guy might be an option. He is highly, highly regarded in the defensive backs room. Obviously, they had to replace Dante Williams with that hire. Um, and then the most important, perhaps, has been the hiring of Eric Henderson, who is currently the co-defensive coordinator and the co-defensive line coach because they kept uh, Coach Sua, who was the defensive line coach last year. They maintained him on staff. So Henderson is the co-DC and the co-defensive uh, line coach. And he's the guy wrote lately, ladies and gentlemen, who's been making all these big plays on the recruiting uh, edge or on the recruiting trail. This is a, a gentleman who spent the last four years coaching Aaron Donald uh, with the Los Angeles Rams. Now, most Georgia fans will hear that and they'll say, oh, congrats. You made a Hall of Fame player a slightly better Hall of Fame player. And I, I slightly agree with you, except for Aaron Donald has obviously made it known that he credits this gentleman with a lot of his development. And it could be lip service. It could be him just talking for one of his buddies that has now got a new job. But Aaron Donald was in town this past weekend, and Aaron Donald talks very, very highly of Eric Henderson. And Aaron Donald to a defensive lineman is like Michael Jordan walking around. I mean, my God. And whatever that guy says is holy grail to a lot of these young men that play this defensive line position. I would imagine if you were eight years old when Aaron Donald became something, you probably think he's the greatest of all time. I think he probably is the greatest of all time, despite the fact that he only played 10 years, right? Uh, but at that spot... He is holy water. You know what I mean? He's the holy grail. So whatever he says kind of goes uh, or at least carries a lot of weight in these folks' minds. So he was there this weekend uh, and, and just casually dropped in and did like a little check-in. They knew they had a big weekend coming up, and he was there, right? Um but they've already re revamped the the energy, it seems, on the defensive side of the football this spring just from a coaching perspective, right? And when you look at those four hires, those were not cheap. Those were not uh, young up-and-coming names. Those were all proven commodities, and they cost a lot of money to get onto your staff. So he has dedicated a lot of resources to the defensive side of the football, and that is the, that is the exact thing that we have always talked about. Okay, whether it be coaching or especially player acquisition, when you, when you uh, date back Lincoln Riley's recruitment processes, even back at Oklahoma, he was signing like probably three to one, two to one offense to defense. Okay, he would sign two great offensive players and one mediocre defensive player. And then when he needed defensive guys, he started portal hopping. He started doing the same thing at USC, taking a whole bunch of portal guys, not really recruiting the defensive side of the football uh, in the high school ranks. And that has totally changed, obviously, based off of Sunday. So we are a channel that talks about consistency and talks about all these things. But when we say you need to do something and you go out and do it from multiple standpoints, that being allocating resources to the defensive side of the football. Guys, you have to applaud Lincoln Riley for at least the decisions that he's making. Before we start talking about money and NIL and all the excuses, give them credit first and foremost for what they actually pulled off this past weekend. I mean, yeah, it certainly grabbed my attention. You go and get some defensive players like that, especially someone like Justice Terry, a known commodity in this next class on the defensive line, the difference maker for a defense that needs it. You're going to get some attention, and it's granted, absolutely. I mean, this is what he needs to be doing on the recruiting trail. You know, every time Lincoln Riley gets the five-star wide receiver or the next big thing at quarterback, whatever, people are like, okay, well, that's Lincoln Riley. That's what he's done for the last six or seven years. But then you start getting defensive players. It's like, well, maybe the tides are turning a little bit for Lincoln Riley. Like, this is kind of something that everybody has been wanting to see from him. So anybody that is a fan or has been paying attention to Lincoln Riley, you have to, th you have to think, like, oh, maybe there's some respect that needs to be given here. It took Lincoln Riley going to the Big Ten for him to finally be like, okay, I need to invest in defense. <laughs> uh, yeah. Big 12, you just score 42 a game, you'd be all right. Pac-12, Pac score 45 a game, you'd be all right. So, yeah, it doesn't – I mean, it kind of ties in. It's a joke, but it's serious. Yeah. I think it took seven and five and everyone looking at him like, if you don't get it figured out, I'm not saying we're going to fire you, but right. we, we, we're not going to be happy. We're going to pin you in a corner and basically say you're an offensive guy only and you can't fully have a team that is national championship caliber. And the NFL doesn't look to be calling. Yeah, no. not, not anymore as of late. That's the first part of this conversation, right? It's the first part of this conversation of look at all the coaches that they put on this staff. Look at all the changes that they have made culturally, right? Just in terms of what's important to us and what we are allocating resources to. The second part of this discussion is is the financials right because it's 2024 it's 2025 recruiting in college football and we know nowadays that um these deals i don't think they get done just willy-nilly now i'm not going to say what i've heard um i'm not going to do any of that and i'm not ready to believe that um 
you know, out of state kids made this decision all based off of money. I'm sure there was some great recruiting going on this past weekend. Um, but these, a lot of these young men have never seen LA. A lot of these young men have never seen um, what it's like out there. Um, you talk about Manchester, Georgia. You talk about Warner Robins, Georgia. You talk about some parts of Florida. Um, I don't know much about the Cordova kid from Texas. He's from Lake Travis. That's a massive, massive high school in a metro Atlanta or a metro area. I, he's probably seen um, some of the nicer things in the world being from that area. But you go out to LA and you're going to be kind of blown away, right? Um, but from a resources standpoint, it was not cheap this weekend, I would imagine. However, the more and more I talk to people about this, I hear some people say, good Lord, you should hear some of these sticker prices, sticker prices. And then, of course, the USC side's like, nah, man, we just out recruited your ass. Quit, quit complaining. You know what I mean? People inside that building are like, nah, dude, we did this. We didn't, we didn't buy this. We did this. Sure. So I don't know where I stand. I bet the, the, the reality is probably somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it reminds me a lot of what Dion was doing at Colorado a while back, or last year for that matter, where basically he was saying, oh, no, we're out recruiting you, but what's drawing you to a Colorado team that was winless in the first place? Obviously, Coach Prime has a big pool, but there's probably some other things going on there. So I, I think you're right. It is a little 50-50 of both. There's probably the truth somewhere in the middle. So I think that, I mean, everybody kind of expected USC to be able to do this right out of the gate when NIL was became a thing of like, oh, it, it's USC, yeah. they're, in, they're LA based, like they're going to have money to pull from, they're going to be able to recruit like yeah. USC should be able to recruit, but it really hasn't been up until now where they've kind of holistically poured in resources into multiple positions and whatnot. Do you think that maybe plays a role in like, oh, we have Julian Lewis coming in. We're trying to help that stick. We really need to start putting in resources into other things. I think when NIO first came out, I, I heard from USC folks like, we're about to slay. Mm -hmm. We're about to get everything we've ever wanted. But I think it took, I think it's still taking time because you got to get people pointed in the right direction, right? You, first of all, you got to pool the money. Good God. I mean, yeah. it's hard enough to get people to donate, mm -hmm. let alone get it all in one pot and make sure it stays there and gets allocated correctly, right? So I think it's part of these, the reason Southeastern schools are so far ahead of this because boosters have been pooling their money together quietly for years. Now they're having to do it with a, a, a public and, and legal mission. Whereas USC is now probably just starting to call these donors at a higher rate than they used to and just now starting to organize the money and pooling the money. Whether or not they had it has always been there. Whether or not they were doing the right things with it has been the question, right? Um, and we found that out. And, and the other thing that they probably don't have to spend as much as other schools because they are in LA. Let's be mm -hmm. honest about it, right? Yeah. There are business, a lot more businesses that have marketable or, or marketing budgets out there that have to get spent. I mean, Fortune 500 companies too, not not just uh, Joe's Tire and, and an auto barn down the street that needs to get some of its tax liability knocked down. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about big, big companies that need to get their tax liability knocked down via marketing. Um, so yeah, there's a lot more money to spend out there outside of just the collectives you would imagine. Um, but man, like the thing that's always been confusing about Lincoln Riley, I think from a national perspective, is everybody thinks of him as this offensive genius, and he is, but they, they misconstrued his genius on the offensive side of the football. Lincoln is the first football coach to take air raid concepts and mix them with a power run game. I mix them with real counter run games, real counter gap schemes. Like, I'm going to punch you in the mouth, and I'm going to throw over the top of you. Like Lincoln Riley's offenses can really, really run the football historically. So if you give that team a defense and they've always been able to run the football, leads are going to be really, really safe, you would imagine, against USC if they have anything resembling a defense. I mean, yeah, if you remember the 2017 Rose Bowl, I mean, it was Baker Mayfield being Baker Mayfield, but it was also the Anderson kid. I can't remember his first name. He was running back for them at the time. Robbie Anderson, I believe. Yeah, and I mean, they were pounding the rock for a good bit of that football game. The running game is really what kept them extending their lead from Georgia throughout that football game. Hmm. He had to get it fixed. Yeah. He had, had to. to. If he did nothing this offseason, he should have. I thought he should have done that last offseason when he had a Heisman quarterback. Yeah, I mean, you know, he tried two, via the portal. He obviously. should have did it two seasons ago, honestly, yeah. when you had a team that was competing for the Pac 12 championship. And as soon as you got there, you knew you were going to have a good, great quarterback. Yeah. And the great quarterback was bringing some of the offensive talent from Oklahoma. So, yeah, I, maybe two years too late. 
right? But you would imagine if they hold on to Julian Lewis that they're going to have really good quarterback play again very, very soon. Mm -hmm. Not that Miller Moss isn't, but he's not not what they've had, obviously. I mean, right. it kind of makes me think of how we've spoken about Billy Napier a little bit of like, you got to get to this recruiting class with DJ Lagway. Like, you got to survive. Oh, yeah. You got to continue yeah, to get on. there. Like, that's great that you have this recruiting class coming in. That's great that your 2025 class has all of these prospects and all these five stars. But you got to get through this next slate, too. I mean, this doesn't change anything for your outlook of the 2024 season. Like you mentioned, you're still banking on Miller Moss being able to keep that offensive flow, and you're still banking on your defense showing slight improvement enough to where you are competitive in your new conference. You, you mentioned holding on, right? You got to survive the season. And, and this is deja vu you know, from the 2022 signing class, right? They, they get Michael Williams and Kristen Miller to commit. And uh, that, you know, maybe a little bit early, right? I think that was in late May, maybe early June. They don't quite hold on all the way through. They don't hold on. They don't hold on all the way through National Signing Day. There was a few mistakes made during that process um, on USC's end that ultimately cost them that. But here, here's the difference in, in this situation and that situation. If you presume money to be a factor, the money is at a much higher rate now than it was in 2022 because things have just risen. The whole market has risen, right? The average uh, value and the average down payment for some of these houses, if you will, has drastically skyrocketed. <clears throat> All right. Um, should we talk about Dion? I feel Always like there's time. never a bad time to talk about Dion, so bring it. You know, as much as... Uh, as much as all the algorithm chasing that, you know, all, all of us have to do in this industry, the algorithm tells me y'all want Dion. Y'all want us to talk Dion. I see it all over. Everyone's views do great on Dion. The, uh, Google Trends, YouTube Trends tell us we should talk Dion. But my audience never wants to talk Dion. So y'all buy the mouthpiece right quick. We fit to talk Dion. Um, Dion Sanders, quote, when asked about Shadur Sanders, and uh, what's Travis's last? Travis Hunter's uh, NFL draft. I don't know why I keep forgetting Travis Hunter's last name. I almost called him Travis Pastrana just now. Yeah, CTE brain going Duh. crazy up here. <laughs> the Daredevil um, guy? The BMX guy? Yeah, BMX guy. Triple backflip guy. Hell yeah. Actually, I think he only pulled two. He's going for three this year. Still he's, doing it. He's still doing it? Travis out here still getting down. So, shouts out to Pastrana. Anyways, Dion was asked about their draft prospects this year and what they think he's going to go. Like, hey, where do you think Travis and Shadur are going to go? And he said, top four. Immediately, top four. But that wasn't the interesting quote. We know that. He thinks very highly of these two individuals, uh, who he calls both his sons. And then he said, but don't forget about Shiloh either. That was a, a cool little slip in there. But he said, uh, at the end of the quote, he said, but some cities are going to get told no. Some cities, it's, and the quote was, it's going to be an Eli Manning. I love how Eli Manning's now a verb. It's going to be an Eli Manning. Is that a verb? That's a noun. Noun? I mean, Adverb. it's still a, it's still a noun. But verb, if you're but... pulling it, it's an action, right? Yeah, if you say, we are going to Eli Manning, then... Yeah, that, yeah. then it's a Oh, verb. we're going to Eli Manning. But if we're going to pull a... It's a... Yeah, yeah okay, okay. Um, yeah, so anyways, going to pull an Eli Manning. Now, my first question was... Um, or my first thought was, Schroeder Sanders is probably a first-round draft pick. I mean, going to get a grade like that. Most right? likely. Whether it be someone thinking he's a back-of-the-first-round quarterback next year or whether they think he's a top-10 pick, that's still yet to be determined. But we feel kind of safe. But sitting here saying he's automatically the number-one quarterback is not true. We don't mm -hmm. believe that no. in the case. Okay, so there's still some room to grow there, still some, some proof that needs to be found there. And I don't know how y'all feel about Travis Hunter. But I don't think Travis Hunter is a top five eval. I think top. I think maybe like top three corner next year. Like, hey, going to get first round looks. But this idea that one's going to go number one and the other one's not going to fall out of the top four. He's obviously talking about Shadur going one and Travis not falling out of the top five. Um, but here's the thing: when I when I start having these thought processes, I start coming down to the the, the idea that who would know more about their draft evaluation than Dion. Right, Dion gets these NFL guys into the building, and I, these NFL guys don't lie. They they don't lie, so they they tell them what it is. So I would imagine the um, most of the, the the serious talk about we aren't playing for you. It's actually probably real talk, and most of it, if it actually comes down to this, like we are not going there. You can draft us, that's fine. We're not going there. Most of that real conversation, holding the feet to the fire, will be done behind closed doors. You would imagine as draft processes get closer, he's not going to release a list of teams that they're not playing for. It's going to be they go to the NFL Combine, they have a meeting with a team, and they sit down and say, well, we're not coming here. 
and it'll be kind of behind closed doors. But um, my thought process was after realizing and having the conversation with myself about him knowing this information, they must have leverage. They must have some kind of leverage. At this point in the game, I mean, I feel like that's kind of lip service. I mean, two months ago, Caleb Williams was like, Caleb Williams' dad was like, he's not going to Chicago. That never, he's not going to play that, in Chicago. Th those quotes were never directly attributed. Right, to but him. it's like, it's, they, they were implying it's strong, kind of like, hey, you know, he has leverage. I, back I don't last know. summer, yeah. I remember what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah like, we, can, we can decide to come back to college because right. NIL money Yeah, so kind great. of That kind was of, the leverage yeah. point, though. But again, I, I don't know how much leverage you would have. I mean, yeah, a year out from the draft when you're the next class, of course you have all the leverage in the world. You can say whatever you want. But right now as it stands, I mean, who's just like we said, who's to say Shadur Sanders is the first quarterback taken off the board? Who's to say Travis Hunter is even a first-round eval? Not to say that these two things are connected, but I feel like they have to be somewhat of those comments were made about Caleb Williams, but then you also have seen what the Bears have done leading up into the draft. Right. I mean, they have poured assets into that roster. They got rid of Justin Fields, and they're basically saying, we're all in on you, and we're trying to make sure that you come in here, and it's it's comfortable for you. It's not going to be this train wreck that it has been for the last few years. So maybe that was their efforts to making sure that you can't say no to us at this point. Like, we're the number one pick, and we've got this thing afloat now. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what Eli's leverage was. Eli just threw a fit. Yeah. So we won't play there. Pretty much. Elway is another example. Elway had MLB aspirations as a baseball player. Elway was like a 350 hitter at Stanford and was their best pitcher in shortstop. Like he was a – I think he got drafted by the Yankees, to be Probably. honest with you. I think he, so did. Like, he He was a really, really good baseball player, and that was his leverage. Outside of that, and Eli's leverage was I was – I would assume is I'm a Manning. Probably. I, mean, I, I guess, and people just bent to it. But th this does, we don't have precedence for this. We have two examples, and one guy had a tremendous option as a, as a potential first-round baseball player, and the other one was Eli Manning. Okay. Did Kyler Murray do this? No. There Kyler were Murray, just discussions of no. could you waste it. Kyler Murray robbed the Oakland Athletics. Yes. Y'all don't remember the story? Oh, I remember, I remember that. that. Yes. He robbed them. He took their $1.2 million in the third round and then went back to Oklahoma and never played a single inning of baseball for Oakland. Yeah, and that was the whole discussion of could you waste a draft pick on Kyler Murray. Correct. So I, I just don't know. But again, he must have something. He must know something. Or unless it's just lip service. I, I think I'm. We leaning, get a lot of lip service from Dion. I'm leaning more towards it's just lip service from a year out to be saying stuff like this. It's it's kind of outlandish for me. It's 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 arrogant, but to a point of like almost too arrogant for Dion to say. I just think it's dumb, honestly. Yeah. I think I think it's dumb to say things like this. Like you're again, you're a year out from this happening. You haven't even played your final season at Colorado. You have no idea what, what's going to happen there, but. I mean, if you're going to be – my whole thing is, like, you're going to be a first-round pick, then go. Like, go be wherever you're going to be for your first-round pick. Go be with that team. I just think it's dumb to, like, go ahead and count yourself out of situations that you could possibly be put into. I just think it's dumb to say no to those possible doors and just automatically shut them. I think it's also kind of being done to increase demand for you, kind of like mm -hmm. being like the, oh, you know – Certain you can't have us, but certain teams can. It increases talks about this player. It increases almost the desire for it. So, I'm trying to think of. Uh, I think he's like a Shadur is better than I think a lot of people thought, but not. I like leverage your own future. You got all your yeah. The the one take I did see, and it's Robert Griffin and RG three. I love him on television. I love him when he's calling games because I appreciate that he obviously loves what he's doing. He has so much fun doing what he's doing. However, I can't stand him on Twitter. Huh. I cannot stand him on Twitter because it's kind. I mean, it's it's hot takery times a thousand. He's like Mad Dog Russo in Robert Griffin the Third's body is what it feels like sometimes. Like, but the take he had today it makes sense. The take he had today was basically, hey, we've got a whole era of college football athletes that have freedom of mobility uh they get to actively negotiate everything they want they they're they're everyone's at the mercy of them if they're good athletes those people are coming to the nfl so do you think they're going to come to the nfl and just take what they're told to do because they're told to do it and now there's millions of dollars on the line like hundreds of millions of dollars on the line so i'm just going to do what you told me to do or do you think these these young men are still going to try to leverage all of the power that they possibly can no i mean it's definitely the latter yeah, you're definitely going to have players who are now are not used to being told no, you have to do this, or no, you can't come here, or sign this contract because you have to play here. Like there's there's guys that basically choose wherever they go, whatever, do whatever they want for four years of their lives. So yeah, it is going to make a huge difference. What y'all think of his uh his single A Texas high school football comments? Did y'all see these? Yeah, 
I mean, was a single or six A? No, he he played in single A football. Oh, and oh, he was okay. like, I don't see how I don't know, I don't know I don't see a lot of these six mm. A quarterbacks and six A players making it and and doing well in college. I, I and did. then the receipts came immediately. It was yeah. like all of these quarterbacks have played in six A football in the state of Georgia and played in playoff games. I mean, do whatever you got to do to motivate yourself personally yeah. and kind of give yourself that personal edge and drive. But I mean, I wouldn't go publicly saying stuff like that because again, people are going to pull receipts and you're going to look like an idiot. But I, I, I don't have a problem with what he said as the way he said it. It's kind of just, you know, this is the chip I have on my shoulder yeah. where basically, I mean, he's the son of one of the most famous NFL players ever. Like you have to create some sort of edge for yourself. <laughs> that, that was the funny thing as a, as a, as a young man who went to a private school, um, using your privilege of a private school education and playing single A football as a uh, as a as a chip on your shoulder is real weird energy. Like I came over, I overcame all these odds playing single A football at my private school. Do what you gotta do, man. Do what you gotta do. Do it's whatever like every, you gotta like do. Every rapper has a teacher that told them they wouldn't be shit. Yeah, like, every one of them. Every single one. Yeah. All right. Good luck. Um, On to this Riley Leonard story. I think this is kind of weird. Um, Obviously, Riley Leonard had... Did we figure out when the surgery was on? Or it was in January, his first surgery to correct the So the what issue. I found and what I read is that it was basically like two weeks after he had healed from his tie rope surgery that he had had at Duke. This is when these problems started arising. And they put a plate in him in January? Yeah. Two weeks after the, the tight road surgery. That's from what I read, yes. All right, so he got hurt in late October, somewhere September, around that time. September, September 30th. Was September it? 30th, so late September. Yep. About three weeks for swelling to go down. They probably did the tightrope. Yep. Didn't worry about getting him back onto the field. Now, back in January, they had to put a plate in, is what it sounded like, because there were some issues from the tightrope surgery. So they went in and had a second surgery, um, a real surgery, in January and uh, fixed a plate. And now... He's out the rest of the spring, or at least a couple of weeks in the spring, for another um, ankle surgery. They put, like I said, put plates and screws in that puppy a while back, um, and he was a brief participant. Here's what here's what worries me: he was a brief participant in spring practice, and then they shut him down, reevaluated him, and here's the quotes: Riley Leonard will be out the next few weeks due to an additional surgery he had on his ankle Friday, so yesterday, to address a stretch a stress fracture that was beginning to develop. Basically, the surgery was to exchange the current plate he had in his ankle with a new one, and the doctors are doing extremely well. The overall prognosis and health of the ankle is excellent. We'll see when we can get him back. Boys, I don't love the idea that A, tightrope didn't work, B, we had to put a plate in it, C, the plate caused an additional hairline stress fracture in the man's ankle, and now we're having to go clean the plate up. I don't love this. Now, no. I know it's 2024 and ankle injuries and all this good stuff and, and modern medicine and all this good shit, but this sounds weird. Well, I mean, it's also a football player that does not exactly protect himself in moments. I mean, the whole reason why he missed the entire latter half of his college football season last year is because he was living and dying by himself for Duke, trying to beat Notre Dame and getting his – Face slammed into the turf every Trying to win Jay Will some daggum money. Yeah, he was. Man, trying <laughs> to win my heart over, too. I mean, I think, too, like, now that we know it, these rule changes are happening in the NFL and everything, like, I mean, ankles are becoming a bigger thing of what is being targeted as an offensive player. And so knowing that he has these lingering issues still, he's in the tail half of his um, college football career, I think it absolutely raises some red flags in the injury department. This would scare me a lot more if it was an August story or a late July story. Yeah. I mean, right now it, it's kind of like, hey, that's something that's weird. That's something you need to keep an eye on. It could be that they're just doing maintenance surgeries and cleaning it up, and kind of maybe one doctor from Notre Dame's team looked at it and said, you know, we didn't like the way this was done, so we'll go back and fix it. And mm. it, that's just what it is now. So, I mean, it, come September will really be the indicator as to. How big of an issue this is and i know that's so cliche to say just oh wait and see but i i think that this is either gonna be something that's lingering for the rest of his life or they just went in and cleaned up a couple of things that were errant and now they're good to go he'll be good to go come fall yeah hopefully now this sounds weird but hopefully you just hope it was like a uh installation error right maybe they didn't install the plate cor correctly or something yeah. hopefully you don't it's not like something 
that uh, the bone couldn't handle the 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 type of surgery that they right. use or whatever. But it sounds to me like that plate, and it didn't sound. It is. It sounds like that plate caused an additional stress fracture. That's what confused me. It's like whoa, huh. whoa. We went in there to help, and we hurt. Yeah, and I mean, I I don't know much about those types of surgeries and medicine stuff like that. But I mean, it could also be that. He was on it too much or he was doing too, or he tried to come back too early and cause stress that he didn't need to. And that's yeah. what led to the stress. I mean, we don't really know what caused it. And I don't think you're ever going to really figure it out. I think it's just one of those things to kind of keep an eye on and, and wait and see when the season comes. Well, I mean, he didn't rule out him coming back for the spring game. So it do, they don't sound too concerned. I get concerned. I get concerned when we, when we talk about, oh, it's not a big deal. The plate caused an additional stress fracture. I mean, multiple operations on the same body part in the span of, what, six months is kind yeah. of alarming. It's kind of alarming. <laughs> yes. Um, speaking of alarming, we had a, a college football collective company have to come out and issue a they didn't steal our money statement. You ready for this? Okay, so for those of you who don't know, um, Caden Proctor was at Alabama, hit the portal, went to Iowa for a couple months, hit the portal again, Probably going to end up back at Alabama. Has that been officially announced? I think that yeah, was like I think that's like out that's the gate official. that was announced. It was yes. like he's leaving well, Iowa, no, going. It to was Alabama. it was like we think he's going back, but we haven't seen anything from Proctor. Everything. Not that we have to wait on that, but we haven't seen anything official. Maybe I I was under the assumption that was like this is the official expectation. He had he Correct. hadn't officially made it, but everyone was pretty much tapping. I'm not him. doubting it. I, I know for a fact it's going to happen. I'm just wondering where the the public announcement is. You know what's going to be funny? Mark my words right here. March 25th. You know what the first confirmation of, of Caden Proctor being back at Alabama is going to be? What's that? The Alabama Football Collective announcing that he's back on payroll. Uh. <laughs> That's what it's going to be. Because hmm. um, here's what it was from Iowa. Iowa, their, their fan base was obviously very concerned that they had just been duped. Okay, Iowa boosters were calling their collective like, hey, that SOB better not have stolen our money. I gave you a bunch of money to get that big joker back here, and he left. So did he take off with my money, or did he take off with your money? And uh, Iowa's CEO of their collective, Brad Heinrichs, had to issue this statement uh, just last weekend, or just last week. Quote, Swarm, which is their collective company, Swarm operates with both the nonprofit collective side, which relies on generous fan contributions, and the incorporated side, where businesses contract with student-athletes. The statement from Swarm CEO Brad Heinrichs said, quote, Caden Proctor has not received funds from the collective. He received a portion of his Swarm Incorporated contracted payment from a sponsoring business. We are unable to share the details of these contracts due to the confidentiality clauses in the contracts. Supporting Iowa athletics and Iowa nonprofits remains our priority. Thank you for your support. So a company lost their ass on Caden Proctor. You, the Iowa fan that sits in row six in section 107, did not lose your ass on Caden Proctor. So that's good news, right, boys? I guess. <laughs> I mean, sure. I mean, is that even true? Or is that like calling up a company like, hey, listen, we need you to cover this loss for us. So uh, we can come out and say that Caden Proctor didn't take any of our money because our fan base is livid right now. Every time I read these statements about these collectives, I want to know who these CEOs are and where they came from. Um, you know, because they're, they're handling big money. And they're right. handling the salary cap for these programs. And you would assume they're smart people. Um, you would assume they're, they're really, really tied into the program. Um, in most cases, you would assume that they're plants, that they were mm -hmm. planted there. They were not by happenstance. Um, and so Brad, Brad Heinrich's name pops up in this quote. I'm like, who in the hell is Brad Heinrich's? So I did some research today. Do you know what an actuary scientist is? No idea. Have I've you ever seen Along Came Polly? No. No, Neither I haven't of you? actually. It's a good movie. You need to watch it. Uh, make it rain. Um, the the Long Came Polly folks will like that one. Um, an actuary scientist basically is there to establish the risk in any type of investment, insurance policy, whatever. So they take all of the contributing factors and they establish the percentage of risk that the investee or the investor is at. These are really smart numbers people. They are there to uh, mitigate and place a, a statistical numbering system or data point on risk in and of itself. Super smart human. This Brad Heinrichs guy, not only is he one of the best uh, actuary scientists in the world, he also owns, operates, and created one of the biggest actuary scientist companies in the world, Foster & Foster. So Iowa CEO guy about their business. That, that is a very smart individual uh, and a very smart man. Some of these collective uh, CEOs don't strike me like that. 
some of these CEO uh, of these collectives strike me more as like sales managers, like guys who are really good at getting people to buy shit. You know what I mean? They seem more like uh, people who make their, their money off a of commission, like commission salesmen. That's what they seem like to me. But homeboy right here, Mr. Heinrichs, he buy his business. He buy his business. Um, Y'all talk a little bit because I left my Big Ten coaching rankings over there in the other room. So him and Shohei Otani are both actionary scientists. Did you know this, Christian? <laughs> Yo. Is he actually? What? Yeah. I'm, on, I'm not going to lie. I'm Shohei kinda, is actually a scientist? That's what it sounds like to me, at least. I'm he, kinda, he was the one got maybe guiding this interpreter, like, hey, this is a good decision. Let's put some money here, invest it here, and then we'll make some money on the back. I got you a, make the I money. got a sneaky suspicion I'm going 0 for 3 tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I got a uh, sneaky suspicion. What's up? No, nah, I, I honestly, I'm so out of touch with the Shohei Otani stuff that... Um, basically, uh, his interpreter is about to take the fall for him fixing games. Yeah. And nobody in the baseball world is telling anybody because he's the biggest star to ever come across yeah. baseball in like 25 long, long years. Time. Nice. Maybe, maybe, maybe 100 years. Maybe since Babe Ruth was out here dueling. It feels it. that way. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, the, the best baseball player in the world was probably putting like $3 million on eight-leg parlays that involve him giving up a certain amount of runs and striking out a certain amount of times. But hey, Sleeping under the rug. Nobody say nothing. How about them bravos, baby? Uh, top 10, Big 10 coaching rankings. Um, on three, put this out today. Jesse Simonton been out here working his butt off. I hope they're paying him good at on three. Um, but anyways, Big 10 coaching rankings, and I'm going to read them off to you. Ryan Day at one, Lincoln Riley, Dan Lanning, James Franklin, Kirk Ferentz, Luke Fickle, Matt Rule, Jonathan Smith, Sharon Moore, Jed Fish, Brett Bielema, Kirk Signetti, um, PJ Fleck, man, I bet PJ Fleck's pissed off to be down at 13. Mike Loxley, Greg Schiano, David Braun, Ryan Walters, Deshaun Foster. Um, let's play a quick game. Where does Ryan Walters coach? Well, I have it pulled up. Cheater. <laughs> Ryan Walters coaches at. It's not Northwest. Five, then. four, three, two. Where? Purdue. That's the only one I want to play with that because, yeah, it's Big Ten coaches. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the big, big talking point off this one on social media was our guy, Lincoln Riley, uh, the non-grilling son of a bitch, sitting there at number two in the Big Ten coaching rankings. Boys, do you have a problem with it? I have a, a big major, problem. major problem with it. What is it? Uh, Dan Lanning is Dan a better, Dan coach, Lanning is a better coach than Lincoln Riley. Lincoln Riley's best days as a coach are two conferences ago. Mm. Mm -hmm. like like what did he do in the pac 12 that would merit him being a top five coach had a heisman winner went seven and five okay Heis i don't i don't consider heisman winner as much of a coaching accolade i mean kevin someone some. kevin yeah. someone had a heisman winner that's true like like let's be let's be fair and then what makes you think in the big 10 he's he's gonna do anything else he's gonna be anything different than that mm. yeah i i just don't know i I don't think it's – though there's no substance to me for me to think that Lincoln Riley is already the second best coach in the Big Ten, especially considering, like, you could say it's recency bias, but it, it should be it's the recency, recency bias, bias because, I mean, it's the last two years that Dan Lanning has – I mean, even in the first year, while there were some struggles, it's expected of a first-year head coach, but <laughs> he looked a lot better than most other people that would be a first-year head coach. And then in year two, took a substantial step forward, close to being in the college football playoff. Lincoln I, Riley was not. I mean, I understand that run that Lincoln Riley had in Oklahoma where it was – they're essentially a shoe in to win the Big 12. They'll most likely be a playoff team. They'll have a quarterback that's in the Heisman race, and he might even go number one overall, but that was four seasons ago. Yeah, What he's done since then has been underwhelming, to say the least. And I mean, it looks like he's doing his best to turn things around now with what he's done in the, the past few weekends with recruiting and stuff like that, but as far as Lincoln Riley being a top three head coach, I don't know about that. Uh, Matt Rule down at seven, I think should be above Luke Fickle, personally. I'm a big Luke Fickle fan. Mm -hmm. Um but the reason I say this is because Luke Fickle did it once at Cincy. Matt Rule did it twice. Matt Rule did it at Temple, and he did it at Baylor, and then obviously kind of flamed out in the NFL, and then now he's back in Nebraska trying to do it again. So he's revitalized two subpar programs into, you know, top – I mean, Temple is a top 15 program at one point during Rule's regime there. So I, yeah. that, that was my only other one. I guess really. the only the only rebuttal to that would be Fickle got a team to the playoff. Or it's, Fickle had essentially a, mm -hmm. a group of five team playoff worthy for two years straight. I mean, Matt Rule's never really had a playoff team. 
that's the only that's the only rebuttal I'd make to it. But I don't have a major problem with either flip flopping the two. He's in the right place, um, but James Franklin at four just feels gross to me. Yeah, it just yeah. doesn't sit right with me. Again, he's in the right place. I mean, I, I think he's put in the right. I wouldn't say he should be below anybody below him. And I wouldn't say that he should be above anybody above him. It just doesn't sit right with me. You know, he's going to fall like a rock in these rankings now that divisions aren't in the big Kirk Ferentz. Oh Ferentz. my God, Kirk Ferentz is going. I mean, Kirk Ferentz is staring at a five loss. He's another one where I'm like five, like. Yeah, they're yeah. they're in the Big Ten championship and they're competitive every year, but they don't. He does not feel like he's in the like, tupper echelon of Big Ten coaches. And Jonathan Smith being at eight and Jed Fish being at ten, why was what Jonathan Smith did at Oregon State more impressive than what Jed Fish did that quickly at Arizona? No idea. I don't know. I, I guess to be talking to Jesse Simington about. I guess. I guess it's more speculation of what what. How Arizona translates to the big, I don't know. I like Jonathan Smith. Yeah. yeah. I think Jonathan Smith's about as good as a man named Jonathan Smith can be. Old John Smith. <laughs> right there. Just like a 250-yard drive straight as an arrow, just right down the middle. That is Jonathan Smith. You got <laughs> something over there? I'm like just continuing to look at the list. Yeah. It, it kind of looking at it like, it really highlighted how superior the SEC is now. From a coaching standpoint? And, I mean, I know last year Michigan won the big, won the national championship. That coach is gone, though. And, like, it's Ryan Day, it's it's Lincoln Riley, it's Dan Lanning, James Franklin maybe, and then just a bunch of, like, eh? Or, I mean, as you have the SEC, and I mean, I just think the SECs have got a lot better coaching now. Hmm. Who's happier that Jim Harbaugh left? Ryan Day? Or Sharon Moore, who got a head coaching job out of it. Ryan Day. You think so? Yeah. I mean, Sharon Moore got a $2 million pay bump. Maybe more. Maybe $3 million in a pay rate. I think long-term Ryan Day is going to be more happy about it. I think Sharon Moore is probably going to be dealing with the ramifications of what Jim Harbaugh left to that program very quickly. And that I'm the head coach of Michigan. I got a $2 million pay raise. is going to go away pretty quickly. Do you think the Just for Men stock tanks a little bit because he's a little less stressed up there at Ohio State? Hmm. No, I think that's still probably going strong. Yeah, he's not getting any younger. Yeah, the gray the gray doesn't go away. Yeah, it just kind of produces less with the less amount of stress. Is that is that a scientific theory that has been proven that stress does increase your amount of gray hair? I'm sure it has something. Everybody to do with says it. it does. I'm Everyone sure it, does. I'm sure it increases like true? cortisol levels in your bloodstream and then turns to like the pigmentation of your hair going off. But so yeah, so bottom line, short the stocks of just for men just in the Ohio regional area. Is that nah. possible? Can you do that? I'm sure you can, but nah. Nah, you don't think so? All right. You know, at least he's coloring it. At least you don't have to plug it. Yeah. <laughs> Plugs are dangerous. So just ask Joe Buck. You know? You heard that story? <laughs> I, thought Joe, I thought Joe Buck's had a pretty good job done. It, no, he has. He's had too good of a job done. Dude, I don't want to expose Joe Buck's business, but he, he's talked about this. Joe Buck got addicted to hair plugs. Almost lost his voice because of it. Addicted, addicted to addicted, hair plugs? Was getting like, like multiple surgeries a year plugging his hair. Ooh, yeah, it's really? A whole, it's a whole story. He almost lost his vocal cords because of it. Um, he got put under anesthesia, and then they had problems pulling the tube back out, and they scratched his vocal cords. And for like four months, he couldn't talk. For a guy he almost that almost lost his career. For a guy that barely ever has his face on the television, <clears throat> that's a lot of money being poured into something. That hey, brother, as someone who loves their hair, I relate. I ain't gonna be <laughs> out here. I ain't gonna be out here going under the under the anesthesia seven times a year, getting my forehead plugged, but. I might, because this is not going to look good bald. I'm going to tell you that right now. Maybe. Caillou out here. Looking like a big old eight ball or a big <laughs> old cue ball. No facial hair, growing head ass. All right. We have a whole nother hour of great content coming for you. I know a lot of you people showed up today to hear about Justice Terry. We're going to talk a little bit more about it in just a second. Welcome to Talk the Dog, the show where we find a bone to pick and a take to give. These are not hot takes. These is dog takes. Can I talk that dog? Let's shut up and grab some tape. 
Boys, we got we got Maryland Terps in the chat tonight. How about that? Hell yeah. Progress. Algorithm treating us well tonight, mm. huh, bud? Uh, if you are a new listener tonight and you have found us via, you know, your search engines or somebody popped you up, the, the statistics, boys, tell us about one out of every four viewer is not subscribed to our platform. So if you are one of those four, I challenge you today, please subscribe. We, if you've liked any portion of tonight's broadcast, we do this Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday during the off season. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday from 8 to 10 o'clock here on the East Coast uh, every single night. So make sure you're joining us, man. We do great work here, I believe. I'm very proud of it. So um, welcome to our local hour. We got a loaded one, loaded one for you. Uh, we're going to talk about whether or not it is time to panic yet. We're going to talk about whether or not Justice Terry is the final decommit from this class or whether or not there will be some potential uh, movements continuing. We're going to talk about the latest commitments that have come uh, in the 2025 and 2026 class, including the number one quarterback in the country but i want to before we get too far into tonight's local hour make sure you're hitting that thumbs up button okay make sure you are subscribing make sure you are leaving some comments and make sure you are firing in off of that chat and supporting our friends over at prize picks we appreciate all those folks over there we also have another sponsor coming in relatively soon i believe okay relatively soon and i'm super excited about that one uh, particularly for our local fans here our, our, our local georgia fans um, that love the content there and we also have a new addition here in the studio that you're going to see in a little bit that i'm super proud of as well so great night tonight to be here on the film guy network is it time to panic the question I get asked every spring and every summer, it feels like, mm -hmm. hey, is it time? What the hell's going on? What the hell's going on? Why, 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 right? I feel like every time of the year, this, this time of the year, everyone is worried about Georgia recruiting. Every spring, we are being asked questions about the class. And every spring, I come on here and I go on Dogs Daily and I go into our Discord over on patreon.com forward slash Brooks Austin. Make sure you're subscribing. And I tell people, hey, calm down, calm down, calm down. R E L A X. Relax, relax, relax. Everything's going to be all right. And uh, this spring, right now, March 25th, just lost a five-star commit, okay? Just lost a five-star in-state prospect to USC. I'm telling you right now, I kind of feel the same way. I kind of feel the same way. Do not panic. It's Kirby Smart. Everything's going to be all right. Kind of. I do believe that everything will be fine. I believe that solely, right? But it is harder than ever, harder than ever to be out here on the recruiting service or on the recruiting um, you know, world, it's harder than ever to be selling development when budgets are boundless. And that's what we have right now. We have budgets at some places that are absolutely boundless. They have no limits. There is no cap salary. There is no, hey, no, we can't pay for that because we won't be able to do this. There's not a lot of that as some of these programs across the country. Um, and let's be honest about Lincoln, whether it be uh, an allocation of resources to his coaching staff or whether it be an allocation of resources to his collective, whatever you want to point to in this situation, Lincoln Riley's back is against the wall with regards to talent acquisitions on the defensive side of the football. If he does not get it fixed, there will be problems eventually for the number two ranked quarterback or, or coach in the Big Ten. Okay, Eventually, there will be problems if he doesn't get it fixed. And at defense right now, it is get it fixed at all costs, literally at all costs. Um, they made promises. Not only are you unwilling to make I don't know if you're capable of making sometimes on the NIL front, right? It's not time to panic, okay? But it is time to realize something. It's harder than ever, like I said, to sell just development, okay? To sell just development nowadays, even if you develop at the rate that Georgia does, it is very, very hard. I'm not going to get into any numbers, but there are other programs on the recruiting circuit. It's not just USC. It may not even be USC, but there are schools that you recruit against every single cycle moving forward until some type of sanctions come around um, that play on a different level of field than you do, right? Sometimes three or four times the size field, if you know what I'm talking about, that you do, okay? You're going to lose a Justice Terry every once in a while. You're going to lose an Isaiah Gibson every once in a while moving forward, um, and that's something that you need to understand. This is no longer the days where – Georgia is the big spender because guys there were days like that you should know that there were days where Georgia was the big spender or one of the big spenders on the recruiting trail they are no longer that and again I don't know if it's a willingness thing I don't know if it's a Kirby doesn't want to they don't want to set precedence for this they don't want to do I don't know what it is maybe they're waiting out sanctions or waiting out regulations I don't know I don't know whether it's a willingness 
or an inability to. I don't believe it's an inability to. I think Georgia and the University of Georgia football program has plenty of access to money. If you don't believe, walk around, look at the facilities. All right, they have plenty of access to money. They have plenty of access to booster money. They have plenty of access to Fortune 500 money or at least real business money in the Atlanta and and, and Athens metro area. So I don't know if it's a willingness or an inability. I don't believe it to be an inability. It has much more to do with unwillingness. And I'm fine with that. If your football coach comes to you and says, I do not want to set the precedence for paying out of market budgets or paying uh, ridiculous amounts for certain individuals because I don't like the precedence that it sets, then boom, right there. Go ahead. I'm fine with that. I'm good with that as long as, again, we're consistent. But as a fan, you have to understand that you're going to miss out on a couple of these every once in a while. I'm not saying Justice Terry's gone for good. In fact, I like the chances that he ends up back in this class, but it's going to be hard. Okay, you're going to have to go to work. All right, you're absolutely going to have to go to work. Um, but here's the case, right? Here's the here's the main thing. You can lose a Justice Terry. You can lose an Isaiah Gibson as long as you don't lose an Elijah Griffin, right? Well, you're not going to win them all anymore. This is not Pokemon. You're not going to be out here catching them all, okay? You're just not. Not nowadays, okay? Um, again, I, I think this is a, a shift for a lot of Georgia fans um, because I don't even know if you knew during the times where – you know, maybe NIL wasn't around that you were one of the bigger spenders. Yeah. I don't know. I made Georgia fans recognize that fact. I think we kind of understand. I'm more asking than telling. I would honestly say no, just because like, I mean, heck you think back four years. I mean, anytime Georgia got a five-star commit, every other fan was like, Oh, Georgia's dropping a bag on that one. And every Georgia fan was saying we play clean over here. Kirby smart ain't doing none of that cheating. Like, so I think that it's probably a mix. I don't want to speak for everybody, but I would say that it, I wouldn't say it's as many as you think it is. We're acknowledging that fact. I personally felt like there was probably some money throwing around going on just because the amount of recruits you got. I mean, the running joke for a lot of teams was Kirby buys all these five stars and he can't win a national title. For sure. Like that's how it was from 2017 to 2020. Like he couldn't, he couldn't do it. But um, I, I don't think it was, I've ever expected them or thought that they were like one of the top spenders. Maybe I, if I were in Georgia's situation, and the same thing I would have done if I was in Nick Saban's situation, where I develop and win at a much higher rate than everybody else in the sport, mm -hmm. um, I would wait out regulations. I wouldn't risk compromising my culture around the building from a team perspective, that yeah. the team is bigger than me or that individual success is not the deal. We are a team that wins based off of our work ethic and our, and our toughness and, and all that stuff that they preach at Georgia. If I were that and I won at that rate and I still were re able to recruit at a top three level despite having to make these concessions, I would wait out the regulations. And mm -hmm. I think it seems to me that's the plan. Yeah, and, and I mean, like, let's be honest. As much as, like, the Nolan Smiths and the Quay Walkers of the world helped you build what you have right now, you also needed the Lad McConkeys, the Jordan Davises, and the Stetson Bennetts. Like, mm. the guys that you weren't having to spend big money on that you developed into absolute killers, like some of the best players you've had in the past five years. Like, so as long as you're still hitting on those guys, you can lose Nikar, you can lose Dylan Ryle, you can lose Justice Terry, I think, as long as you're still developing, which I'm, there's no indication that Kirby's not going to be able to do that. And you're going to, we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. Basically, what, how, how do you reshape your recruiting ideals if this is the case, right? If you know that some of these are going to get missed out on, you're right. Your evaluation process has to become much, much better. Welcome into our local hour. We do indeed have a loaded one for you. Uh, we'll talk about the loss again of Justice Terry and Isaiah Gibson, more from an evaluation standpoint and what was lost and what might be replaced, some possible replacements there on that front. Is your You only have five commits currently in 2025. Are those 100% solid? Do we have to worry about any more potential Justice Terry type situations? We'll talk a little bit about that tonight. We'll hit on the Trevor NTN stuff right now. Um, stupid ass decision, mistake, massive mistake. Under 21 years old, doesn't matter. Below the legal limit, doesn't matter. 19 years old, drinking and driving, past midnight, go to bed, period. We'll just leave it at that. Um, we'll be handled internally. We have a... I don't like reporting on these things. Everybody in our industry rushes to them because you saw, y'all know what Google Trends are. Y'all saw mm -hmm. the Google Trends the last two days. Yep. Anything anyone's reading right now, the last two days, last 48 hours has been about Trevor Etienne's worst decision that he's made in his young life. Um, we have a felony rule at Dogs Daily. I don't bury leads. I don't bury stories. But I don't, I don't feel good about talking about misdemeanors from 19-year-old children. You got 19-year-old young men. Now, here's the other thing about this. 
we it's a different world of college football now, right? Used to, it was a kid on scholarship and he plays football and he's a student athlete. Now it's all of that, plus that kid might be making X amount of dollars and we've invested in him drastically, so he's held to a higher standard. I get that too. So I understand that when you make dumb mistakes like this, you're going to end up in the news articles, you're going to end up on the headlines of everything. We choose not to do it. Again, Unless or we got a felony line. Go commit a felony and we'll, we'll be out here writing articles about you, but misdemeanors for dumb, dumb, dumb decisions be better. That's yeah. all you need. All right. Um, nice and quick there. Shout out to Prize Picks. Hit that thumbs up button. Let's talk about the good news. Uh, Jared Curse, 2026 quarterback out of the state of Tennessee. Um, number one quarterback in the 2026 class. And based off all indications, and I told Patreon this this weekend, um, it sounded like things were always trended in this direction for Curtis. It sounded like him and Georgia were always really, really tied together. And he was always the option and always the likelihood the moment Julian Lewis reclassified. The moment Julian Lewis went from 2026 to 2025, Jared Curtis, marriage in heaven, right? Just already sign it up, let's go. Um, and it sounds like he called in this past weekend and wanted into the uh, into the 2026 class and didn't want to waste any time. So I just hope that the, the Georgia first commitment curse doesn't continue because he is the first commit in 2026, which means by law at the University of Georgia, he has to decommit, okay? Hasn't happened since 2020 when David Daniel went wire to wire. So we'll see if Jared Curtis can go wire to wire. Hoping he does, because he's the number one quarterback in America, uh, and there's a reason why, right? I I'm going to go ahead and talk you through the eval before I walk you through the eval over there on the board. Um, six foot three with thick lowers. Talked about thick lowers and thick mids on these quarterbacks. I want to see a lot of internal uh, inertia from that middle, from them nips down okay got to be thick in the mids and lowers as a quarterback to have a big big one percent arm that's exactly what he's got he's got extremely effortless life on the football i will tell you this though and i think this is very very important and i don't want to sound like a hater because again told you earlier i played single a football i understand there are good football players that come out of single a every single year dozens of them that come out and play but this is some of the most atrocious comp and like competition I've seen on tape. It's really, really, really bad. Okay, really, really bad. Um, I will guarantee he's got huge hands. I haven't measured him. I can tell by the way he throws the football, though, he's got some mitts on him. I'm talking about nine, nine inches or nine and ten sixteenth at least. Okay, borderline <laughs> ten inches in hands. Okay, got big old hands. Can tell by the way he spins it. Um, there is one clip in here, one clip in the entire film we're going to watch that's against Prince Avenue, a game that I know Ooh. for a fact he threw four interceptions. It was not good. Ooh. And the reason I want you to know that he played Prince Avenue is because I want you to go, the moment you look up on this film, audience, and you notice that, wow, that defense looks like it's filled with good football players. Put your hand up. Okay, and I want one of you guys to go, whoo, hey, those guys look good the moment you see it because it's I mean, it stuck out like a sore thumb on this tape. And that's Prince Avenue. That's Prince Avenue. Prince Avenue, great football team. Prince Avenue is not Grayson. <laughs> you know what I mean? Prince Avenue is not Buford. Prince Avenue here in the state of Georgia is not Cedar Grove. Okay, so there are a lot, a lot of uh, talent discrepancies here and transitions that he's going to have to make. He is an okay athlete. This tape's going to make him look like a superstar athlete. If you told me he was a 4.85 runner, I'd say right on the nail. That's exactly what that guy is, okay? Um, but he's a good enough athlete. You take the 1% arm because that's exactly what this guy is. He is a 1% arm right here, and I'm excited to watch the tape with you. Let's go to the board. I'm going to take my notes here because I think we're going to spend the rest of the night at the board, to be honest with you. Uh, put me into three. Should we name this guy? That's completely up to you. Barry the Buffalo? I'm an alliterations guy. We'll have to name this guy. Okay, shouts out to the family right here. Brutus. Brutus? I don't know. That's a, that's a good call right there. Barry Brutus not a bad a shot. Barry wimpy. Barry does sound a little wimpy. We'll get to it. We'll name the Buffalo eventually. But, you know, he's hanging out up there. Uh, he's a Brody, and he's signed by some of our very first uh, and longest lasting subscribers over on patreon.com forward slash Brooks Austin. Boys and girls, thank you very much. This was a gift given to me, and I love it dearly. Um, wish somebody would avoid it signing the penis, but it is what it is. Let's go. Let's watch some tape. All right. 
You see what I'm talking about with the comp? Yeah. I mean, off rip, you can just kind of tell, okay, that that's a little bit different. But you are going to see life. Buddy has an absolute chooch on him. One percenter. This ain't no two percent choocher. This is a one percent chooch kind of guy. All right. I think that ball traveled about 65 yards, to be honest with you. Um, and there's that off one foot flick. Look at the ball location, mm. though, right? The the throw's awesome. The location of the football is far more important. Swing us or sing us the two right there. Look at his ball. That ball is put right away from that defender at the highest catch point for his wide receiver. Ball behind the back. Here's when I was like, all right, Buddy must have some really big mitts on him. All right, this next play, he takes his ball off play fake and puts it right behind his back all willy-nilly casually like that right there, okay? And then just absolutely looking like a god of an athlete out here on this field. Wow. He's jogging. Yeah. Jog and pull it away from folks. Oh, so this is man. what I'm saying. I, it's great that we look athletic on tape. It's awesome. But I don't know how much of this translates. But here's what I will tell you. Buddy is uber confident and he knows he's got it. Watch him when he throws his ball. He, he pulls a Steph Curry. Watch him right here. He's going to throw this ball, turn away from it. He's going to throw his ball, turn away from it, and it's a tud. I think he was turned away from the guy. He was turned away from there. the hit, but I, I'm just saying. We're going to let that ball rip and come give him one of these. Ain't he worried about it. That ball's getting there. Also, blown coverage. Okay, he yeah. just threw it up in the air. But here you see the athleticism again, ripping through an arm tackle, ball on one foot, just a Ooh. dart. It's a very special arm talent throw right there, guys. That is that is some elite shit on the run. Looks like it's in the rain, too. It is. That's what I'm saying. Big mitts on the kid. When you, when you see somebody cutting it, and what do I mean by cutting it? I'm talking about when they throw it, their, their hand is on the side of that football. They are not a linear thrower. They are rotational throwers. Almost all rotational throwers have to have big mitts because the ball's coming out on the edge. We don't have the pressure points on the top of it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so that's what I'm saying when I say he cuts it. That ball's on the side of that, or that hand's on the side of that football, and he cuts that thing. <laughs> Gotta add big mitts. Mm. All right, I think we're coming up. But, I mean, oh, just wow. Timmy's and Tyler's all <laughs> over the field, bro. Oh, my Timmy's God. Timmy's and Tyler's all over the field. It's like watching a JV team. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, but you I know, just watched a corner. <laughs> what would you see? I, I just watched him hop two times out of his stance. Watch the far corner. Over here? <laughs> yeah. God. All right. So, I think we're getting close. That's Prince Avenue. That is Prince yeah. Avenue. All right. And just look. All right, look at these guys, okay? Everybody get a good mental picture? Mm -hmm. Everybody sees it. All right, we're going to flip to the next picture. All right, and this is the only reason it matters. And I, I don't want to – here's what I'm saying. This, this guy's got elite arm talent. He's one of the more gifted football players we've watched on this network from the quarterback position. I want that to be stated first. However, he threw four interceptions in this football game. Right. Okay? The, the best football team he played all year, and he has no supporting cast. This is a, like a six and five football team, okay? They're not good around him either. All right, but we see, we see actual D1 bodies on the field now, some, and there's not a lot. This is single A private school here in the state of Georgia, and this is by far the best football team they played all year last year. Yeah, and I do think something that needs to be taken into consideration this kid's like 15 years old. Right? Yes, still He's very young. He's got a lot of growing up to do. Very young. And you see, I mean, the right the right guard's getting annihilated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, annihilated. This is almost fun to watch, dude. So this is our and this is our first real clip of him facing pressure so <laughs> Jesus. far. Jesus. Yeah, and, and kind of throws him with anticipation right there. You can see why he threw some interceptions in that football game. I'm sure it was like yeah. that all night long. You know, just getting berated with pressure. Love the lower body mechanics as well as he never locked out. No. I hate when I see kids with the front side knee extension completely locked out. What do here? He gonna run around. This one's the goofiest one he has on the tape. This is all right. You're playing very little comp, right? Yeah. That I mean. Oh my god. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. It's 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 pretty tough. But here's the deal. Okay, do me a favor, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm gonna walk over there and I'm gonna talk for a second. Pull up my recent tweet of him flicking the football and put it up here on the board. Here's the deal about this kid. I, I don't really care what the comp looks. Like. I really don't. And here's why. Because the arm talent is stupid. Mm -hmm. All right, so you take the arm talent, you put them in front of your comp, and you see what happens. This, to me, that looks like Ryan Puglisi tape. Y'all remember watching Ryan Puglisi coming yep. out of high school? It looks to me like Puglisi tape with Riola hype. 
Like, this kid's the number one ranked player in the country, and he's got tape that looks like Puglisi's. But Puglisi played up there in mass, so everyone just assumed it's bad football, I guess. Yeah, I mean, arm talent is arm talent. Like, comp mm-hmm. doesn't really matter for that. Mm-hmm. I think the, oh, my God, this guy's actually, he's, he's actually almost like a dual threat, the way he scrambles. I don't think you're going to see that ever when he gets to the college level because he is going against Timmy's and Tyler's. Yeah, now, he's gained a tremendous amount of weight, particularly, like I said, nips down into the lowers um, since this video. But this is it, guys. Th- this is the arm talent that you are recruiting, okay? The ability to just throw it from all platforms and just hum that sucker, okay? Mm-hmm. He's got one of them ones, all right? He's going to be up there. The first day he gets on campus, he's going to spin it with everybody you know what i mean he's he's going to be able to throw it with just about anybody on that roster um you know he it's just tough it's very very tough to go from that to the other one you know mm-hmm. what i mean to go from i didn't play a single d1 guy all year to now I got nothing but NFL guys I'm playing against every day in practice. Now the question I have, and I don't know if you'll be able to answer this or not, is how is his uh, his processor? Yeah, I got no clue. Because I, I, I haven't seen, I haven't right. talked, that's, I haven't that's talked fine. the game with them. We don't know those things. But I would imagine they threw him on the board really, really quickly. But mm-hmm. um, nah, man, that's that's a, an elite football player from a talent perspective. But there's going to be some growing pains there, you would imagine, as there are for every high school kid. But really for guys who are, are coming from systems and, and places like that. Yeah, that's but, not – He's probably never had any talent around him that res- you yeah, know, looks anything too. like what he's no. going to have. So there, there's that as well. I think that's too – Yeah, here's the, the chat. They got beat by Prince Avenue 42 to nothing. I think the good thing too to know is that mm-hmm. it, when he does get in the class, assuming that he sticks the 2026 class, like he's still going to be like probably a year or two away before he's like having to start. Like regardless of how Georgia's quarterback room evens out by the time he gets there, you still probably have multiple years before you're calling on his name. Talked to another coach not from Prince Avenue that played against him last year, and here's what he said. Uh, Has the ability to make every throw, but does not have a very good supporting cast, which turns him into a gunslinger trying to make every play. Not a super athlete, but will look good in the underwear Olympics. So There you go. And then the classic coach line. If he played for us, he'd light it up. (laughs) (laughs) You know, got to love that. I love the the give me the five-star guy. He 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 just needs me. He just needs me. That's every coach. I would be the same exact way. Just, just, I just let me try. Let me try with Joe Milton. Mm. Just kidding. I would never. Um, but there's going to be somebody that wants to. So good luck on them. Um, all right. So that, that's the quarterback. That's the good news, right? Um, now, the bad news. What's your loss this weekend, right? You lost Justice Terry, and you lost the opportunity to land Isaiah Gibson for the time being. You're going to continue to recruit both football players. There's no doubt about that. Um, I've been on this channel, and the USC fans that exist on the internet found it and started flooding it with a, he's a USC Trojan now. I have videos on this channel of me talking about Justice Terry being the number one defensive lineman in the country. And I believe that. I think he's that good. I think he's going to be that good. Um, So there's that. That is a unquestionable unmitigated loss right with justice terry flipping it's unquestionable uh that is a, indeed a loss however in my opinion the isaiah gibson thing that that was an in-state take you take that kid you're going to continue to recruit that kid he should be a georgia bulldog you should go get that guy but in my in my personal opinion i don't think that's n- anywhere in the same vicinity or ballpark or range of a loss as Justice Terry for a multitude of reasons. I don't think he's that quality of a player because we're talking about somebody who I think is like top three in this class. I don't think he's that quality of player. And B, the position room at defensive end and outside linebacker, the last thing it needs is more talented bodies. I mean, you can take as many as you want, but they, they got enough. They're having a problem playing as many as they got right now. Um, but if you're going to miss out, here's the reality. If you're going to miss out on types like that, these types of guys, um, whether it be to due to other people overpaying or whether it due to the fact that Aaron Donald made somebody happy, whatever it is, whatever is going on, however it is, you have to understand if you're going to miss some of these guys, your scouting department better be elite as shit, right? You better keep finding Jordan Davises. You better keep finding them and finding them often. And I think they tried to take a stab at one this past weekend with Stephon Shivers, the big six foot five, 365 pound nose tackle out of the state of Tennessee. And I'm going to be honest with you this highlight tape we finna watch, this is one of the sexiest big man touchdowns I've ever seen in my life. And I'm excited to watch it. Sexy big man. Have you not seen this? Huh? I can't say that I have, no. So you must not have been following your boy on Twitter this weekend. Because when everything went down and we, we were struggling to put out articles and shit, I was out here tweeting and, uh, 
they right here. they right here made the Twitter timeline because this is nuts. That's homeboy. That's, that's our big fella back there in the oh, eye. Yeah. That's our big boy back there in the eye looking like a buffalo coming down here. Here he come. Here he come. Oh, boy. Oh, no. He hurdled somebody, too. Oh, my God. How did you get outran back there, backside safety? No way. Oh, no way. Gosh. Yes, sir, he did. Yes, sir, he did. Turn he knocked down. Hey, hey, but you know he left the celebration on the highlight tape. I love it. Walking down the track. Hey, th- this one right here is this one right here is set, like guaranteed big man stuff. Pulling up the pants after a tud, bro. You almost lose your britches while scoring a seventy-five yard touchdown at three hundred fifty pounds. You can have an offer to Georgia. I don't give a shit. I love that. Yeah, man. This is a, this is a big boy mover. And he wears the sevens. You know what I mean? I, I love me a seventy-seven. I was a seventy-seven in high school myself. Mm. Cameraman's got to learn to turn the menu off, bro. Yeah, no doubt. Ooh, playing a little offensive tackle, too. Pancake. Okay. Pancake. Ooh, 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 ooh. That kid. Uh, that kid might quit football. Uh, he, got, he got ugly big man swag, too. No, nothing on the wrist and, and, and arms. He's got low socks on high ankle or uh, mid tops. You seeing this right now? Yeah. He got mid top cleats on with no high ankles, no high socks, and no gloves on. He just out here raw dogging. That's wild. Is that strip sack? Uh, I think that's a safety is what that looked like to me. Oh, my God, look at the push. That poor offensive lineman. Oh, my goodness. Poor he looked like me versus Timmy. D'Angelo Brown, 2012 state championship game. Oh, my God. Ooh. Ooh. This dude you is, see the acceleration This on dude is apple? eating souls. Golly. So, yeah, uh, outside the top 900, wow. I think, is Stephon Shivers with this tape. Is it Shivers or Shivers? I mean, he gave me the Shivers. Yeah. Huh. You know what I mean? Fair enough. Oh, he in there running back again. I thought the most impressive thing about this first run was the hurdle over the linebacker in the hole. Did you see it? Yeah. Did you notice that? And then the poor safety that tries to hit him in the legs, right there, he just jumps over for something. And that guy's just like, I'm biting shins and getting the hell out of here. Composite rankings have him at 685 nationally. All right, let's remember that right now. Here we are, March 24th. Send the date a lot today. March 24th, 2023, he is what? 685. 685. I bet he's within the top 300 within the month. What do you want to bet? I'm not going to bet against that. I wouldn't bet against Shit, that. Shit, I bet he might be in the top 250 by the end of the month. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because industries, man, the, the recruiting industry would be working like that. But, hey, if you're going to do this, right, if you're going to uh, not be able to – the classic example was the nose tackle that ended up going to Texas a couple years back, Sadir Mitchell. Sadir Mitchell, huge nose tackle prospect, okay? Everybody in the country that runs a 425 mint one is Sadir Mitchell. Well, Sadir Mitchell outpriced himself really, really quickly at the University of Georgia. So they were like, okay, we can't get Sadir Mitchell. Well, now they're taking stabs on big jokers that they found in Memphis, Tennessee that, you know, ain't nobody been really looking at, which is what Stefan is. So there you go. Um, another player. Talk about Justice Terry, right? You missed out on Justice Terry. Um, I think you're going to need to make some type of move at the defensive tackle position in case Justice Terry does not end up back in the class. So what are you going to have to do, guys? You, you're, you're not – you try with the five-star and Justice Terry. You're going to still – I think you still got a really great shot at Elijah Griffin. I would say you're the leader in the clubhouse. So the next defensive tackle, in my opinion, if you're going to sign another one, if you have to sign another one, he better be a high upside guy. Like, let's go find one of these diamonds in the rough. Let's go find somebody who might be a little bit underrated, like our, our guy Jeremiah right here. What's Jeremiah's last name again? Uh, Jeremiah McLeod. Yes. All right, Jeremiah McLeod is a defensive tackle that is currently committed to Mississippi State. He was on campus this past weekend, got an offer from the University of Georgia. Um, I spoke to him today, and it was like a – yeah, that, cha- that kind of changes everything. Like, we actually have to have a thought. Like, we got to think about things now. I was happy with Mississippi State. Mm-hmm. That's great. Georgia's in the picture now. I'm not saying I'm decommitting. I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. I'm yeah. not saying I'm decommitting, but we, we now have a different thought process. We have to think about these things a little bit differently. So here's the deal about Jeremiah. Jeremiah is like an inch and a half shorter than Justice Terry. Jeremiah is like... 75 percent the the body composition that justice is because justice is a freak okay but this tape kind of looks like justices and this is what you're gonna have to do you're gonna have to take a guy that maybe is a little bit raw or from florida and, and get him into campus and get him on the campus see what he's about see what the body looks like 
then match it with the tape, and then late in the cycle. Maybe you got to flip a guy like this because you don't end up flip reflipping Justice Terry. But here he is right here, and I'm telling you, the, ta the tape's really, really good, guys. He's doing all of this as a five technique at 280 pounds in the state of Florida. There is speed on the field down here, okay? You can't just be a big, lengthy brawler, all right? You got to be a guy that can actually, you know, do some crazy shit. And I think this is exactly what this is. Looks like he's got good hand movement. He does, right and he's got that. really long arms. Uh, and he gets he gets hands into the body really really quickly. Head movement to me is always something that you it, it can be taught, but the best mm. skills are are just natural. You talking about hand fighters, yeah, hand fighters, yeah, yeah. hand fighters specifically. Um, yeah, most of them are actually good fighter fighters too. They got them paws on them. Firefighters, fighter fighters, them boys, them boys yeah. be striking. Um, here we go, stand up defensive end right there. Oh, uh, just Lord. Oof. Yeah, moves really well for 280 pounds, I thought, based mm -hmm. off the tape. And he's a high effort guy. You're going to see a backside TFL right here. Yeah. Dude. Three star. Yeah. Outside the top 1,000. I thought Mississippi State did a tremendous job getting this in so far. Yeah, not even in their own state either. No, this is, a good this pull. is an out-of-state commit. This is a good pull by Mississippi State. It's a tremendous pull by Mississippi State. There is some uh, body development, like I said, from Georgia's perspective, still to have to be done. There, there needs to be some muscle mass put onto this frame. But this is a really, really good athlete at 280 pounds already. There's that hand uh, yep. sh uh, uh, block shedding shed ability right that you're talking about there. Good strike and shed on both of these clips right here. Watch him put his hands on first and then rip and get off. Jeez. Yeah. Playing with a good wide base. And he's, he accelerates through contact really, really well. This is Lowndes. So this, mm -hmm. this is a good football team right here he's playing against. Not that the other ones aren't, but I, I know for a fact that's Lyons. I couldn't see what happened there, honestly. Yeah, he's too far up. This is him fighting off blocks. Good shit again. Yeah, that's a lot of twitch right there, man. Yeah, that's, that is a tremendous haul by Mississippi State. And, again, I, I don't know if he's going to stick. Um, I don't know if Georgia's going all in on him. There's a variety of options like that that have now been opened up and that you're going to have to, you know, take a, a serious look at. But that, that's kind of what's going to have to happen now, right? You're going to have to go from, hey, we had this five-star locked up to, hey, who's the, the, the guy out here that we love and we think we can come in here or get in here and make a much, much better football player? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's always that, – I feel like that's the key to building successful programs. If you can go out and get five stars and develop them, that's fine. There's only so many five stars to go around. And by the way, now you're in an era of college football where they're going to get more evenly spread out because teams can pay for them more. So you have to be able to hit on your three-star guys. Your guys are outside of the top 900, stuff like that. Any thoughts on uh, Mr. Shivers or uh, Mr. McLeod right there? So when was he offered? That's my question. This weekend. This weekend. This past okay. weekend. He was on campus for an unofficial this past weekend and got a note. So that tells me that was a guy that they were kind of maybe waiting and seeing, yeah. like, of what's going to happen. With Do we have people. room for him? Yeah. Yeah, that kind of thing. Um, but that's that's kind of where I'm at, right? And that's why I, I opened the, the local hour with it's not time to panic, but you have five commits. It's it's March 25th, and, and the, the, the building's doing the don't worry, we got it. And I'm, I'm fine with that. And, and normally I do the don't worry, you got it. But this time last year, there were 24 commits in the damn class. You know, this, this class last year, you were done by July. And it was like, hey, what can we add towards the end to make this really, really spicy? Can we get a K.J. Bolden in the mix? Well, right now, March 25th, there are five commits in this class in 2025. And I know, again, I'm telling you, I, I have faith that in Kirby Smart that he's going to be fine. It's the University of Georgia. They're going to be okay. Don't sit here and cause panic. But let's let's let, let's say what it is. They got work to do. They have work to do in this class. There are five current commits, um, and I, again, I I don't think all of them are on solid grounds here. Elias Williams was well documented out at USC this past weekend. Okay, I'm sure the the defensive prospects were not the only ones that were you know getting walked around LA and told all the good gospel that there is to be had for the USC Trojans. Jaden Perlotti is a great football player. He was one of Georgia's very first commits. I shot his commitment photos. I have never felt very good about Jaden Perlotti, like 100% solid. He's going to be there on the dotted line. There is always room for opportunity there, it feels like. All right, the other three, like Bo Walker, for example. I don't know what Bo Walker 
feels about the the transition because I haven't talked to him. I'm sure he likes Josh Crawford. Josh Crawford was probably guaranteed to be recruiting him at Georgia Tech. They have a relationship. But anytime your position coach leaves, that commit is now in question. Especially as soon as the coach leaves, the next day, Bo Walker's at Georgia State as a, on an unofficial visit. I ain't saying he's flipping to Georgia State. I'm just telling you that connotes how big of a relationship he had with Dale McGee. That's all I'm saying there. So, Ethan Barber, Stephen, or Stephon Shivers, who just got in today, I feel confident about. I'm fine. But that's, that's two. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm, like it's, right. it's a lot of work to be done. Again, not sounding alarms. Just, I mean, we got to be honest. That's where it's at right now. I think the point in time where you could really start maybe I would like sounding the alarms a little bit is when you get into like heavy June. Yeah, after all these. And if things are not really setting setting up for you to have your class set in stone before the season starts, and that's when I would be like, Whew, something ain't right here. Something's going on that ain't that usually doesn't happen at Georgia. Yeah, I mean it, it the sky's falling right now and everything. We look horrible and, and the recruiting class isn't where it should be and all that stuff. It's going to turn around. I mean, you, you deal with things like this every year, and, and for some reason the fan base decides it's time to hit the panic button in the spring because we're losing recruits and people are hitting the transfer portal. And what's going on in Athens? Like, it's fine. Just we'll give it time. When we close, when when Kirby Smart closes this 2025 recruiting class, I guarantee you it'll be a top five class, and we'll be looking around going, man, Kirby Smart, how does he do it? He's one of the best recruiters there is. So I don't think there's any reason to freak out right now. Mm-hmm. Um. How much of a role of you're a small town Georgia kid going out to LA did this play a role in? For Justice Terry, both of them. I mean, Isaiah Gibson's for Warren yeah. Robbins. I mean, I feel like it it, it differs per person. I mean, yeah. some people you grow up around it. That's just kind of what you like. Like you don't want to step out of that comfort zone. I mean, I didn't grow up in I would say a small town, um, but I mean, some people just kind of like where you're at. Going into like a complete culture change, going from there to LA. But I mean, some people kind of gravitate to that. You want to change the scenery. You want something different. You want a different lifestyle. So I mean, I get it both ways. But I think it just kind of differs on the type of person. I don't know any of those people personally. Yeah, I mean, I, obviously LA is LA. You know what it is to, to be a, a 19 year old kid who probably has never gone out there and to see that and be like, hey, this could be your home for the next two or three years. And oh, by the way, you'll get a substantial amount of money while you're doing it. And we believe you're so talented that it doesn't really matter where you go. You're still going to get a, a first 60 pick eval. I mean. When you're 18 years old, all those things are enticing to you. So yeah. it's, it's a combination of everything, I think. And Justice specifically said that, uh, you know, he wants to study business. He wants to be a business management major when he gets to college. And what better way to start your entrepreneurship than in L.A. as a, as a star football player? Right. Makes sense on its surface, right? I mean, there's there's a lot. there. Like, let's be fair. There's more long-term business opportunities in Los Angeles, California, than there are Athens, Georgia. Correct. Plus, I, I, I think it's good. It's, I think it's important to play the flip side of this, too. Like, I think it's easy to sit here and say that, oh, these five star defensive linemen going to USC aren't going to be developed because they're going to USC, who isn't known for their defense, and all, yada, yada, yada. Like, Barry Alexander is still going to be a high draft pick. I, I mean, to say that. I mean, he's that's uber what talented. I'm, that's still. what I'm literally Googling right now. I mean, it, 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 the talent doesn't go away because you go to USC. Like, sure, maybe you don't get the same, like, development that you maybe you would from someone like Trey Scott in Georgia because you aren't playing on the same type of defense. But – Barry Alexander was viewed as an uber talented defense lineman coming out of high school and when he was at Georgia. That doesn't change just because he goes to USC. That's not going to change for Justice Terry just because if he goes to USC. So like you can say that, oh, well, he's not going to be developed. That's a bad business decision. <laughs> Justice Terry is going to be fine when he gets to USC as far as his career goes. USC's defense may not holistically get better, but. I have never seen the NFL draft community so goddamn confused as they are about the 2025 class. I'm going to blow your mind here. You ready for this? Nazir Stackhouse is currently the 12th highest rated mock draft kid in 2025. Hell yeah, Nas. 12th highest? 12th. You know who's 13? Dominic Lovett after a 350-yard season. Hell yeah, Dom. Dom Lovett. I mean, I get Tate getting first-round buzz. He's been a starter for four years in the SEC. I get that. But some of these names, man. Like, I don't, I don't understand this at all. But, Jay, well, going off of your kind of, you know, why are these D-linemen going to USC that don't get developed? It, people say the same thing when five-star quarterbacks come to Georgia. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, it just because – Oh, you're not going to be able to develop a quarterback play. They don't play. Kirby Smart can't coach offense. Things such as that. He for a while he didn't have a, as good a track record coaching offense as he did on defense. Carson Beck's going to be a first round quarterback next year. Mm-hmm. I mean, who's to say Lincoln Riley can't turn around? And it seems like he's making a, a more effort than he's ever made before in his coaching career to develop defensive players. So to the idea that oh, you're never going to get developed if you go to USC, I think that's a little unfair. 
my mentions have been just a petri dish lately. And just constantly. I, I don't I get it. I get that other fan bases like to make fun of people when they have shortcomings, but every every comment's like Oh, like I, I commented or I tweeted a photo about Tyke Smith running four four six and it showing up on tape, and someone said four four six. What is that? Is BAC? It's just like constant. Like I get the jokes for them being goofy. You know? Yeah, everyone's. Um, I, you you mentioned Bear Alexander. I hate I hate to do this. I really do, and I might be wrong, but Bear's gonna be drafted really high. Bear, Bear was going to be a really high draft pick. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying like top 15, but he's he's going to be one of the first defensive tackles taken off the board next he'll, year. He'll be gone within the first 45 picks. 60. Top 60. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Top 60, Eva. I mean, when you get to 45 and 60, the money difference is minimal at minimal. that point. But the difference between being a top 10 pick like he might have been had he stayed at Georgia or top 15 pick or top yeah, 20 that's pick. That's the difference is, you're talking about. But again, yeah. like, who's, like, you can't like guarantee he's a top 10 pick. No, you can't. You can't guarantee he's a top 10 pick at Georgia. I mean, and who's to guarantee whatever offset in the draft delta wasn't made up by whatever NIL money he's getting out in L.A.? Correct. So I mean, it's like, just like, not. Let's be, there, are, there are current five stars on Georgia's roster that are not going to be first-round selections. Mm-hmm. Like let let's just be real about that. I don't I don't want to specifically name names, but like th- this idea that if you stay at Georgia, you're guaranteed to be a first round pick or it's t- false. T- it's false. Yeah. I mean, you're much more likely. We've seen it in the past three years, but it's not like you're a shoe in for a first round pick if you stay at Georgia. There are better options for some players where it's hey, let me go out and get substantial more money and still be able to d- display my talents and possibly be a top sixty eval. I think what Georgia does provide you with though is like kind of going back to the Nazir Stackhouse um, conversation of like he's being he's like twelfth right now. I mean, if you look, I remember reading an article they were talking about projecting the twenty twenty five draft class and that Nazir Stackhouse listed as one of the top four um, defensive tackles in the next class. And the exact quote they had in the article was, people are still banking on that Nazir Stackhouse is going to turn into one of these top 45 prospects within the next draft class. And I think that's what Georgia provides you with, is that Mm -hmm. if you're at Georgia, people are going to continue to hold out hope on you and continue to believe in the situation that you're in, the coaching that you have around you, the situation that you're in, that you're going to turn into what people expect you to be. Mm -hmm. Not that Nazir Stackhouse isn't already a a, a talented football player, because he is, and he's going to be a very talented football player for Georgia's next season and play a massive role but I think you get a lot more leeway as a prospect if you're at Georgia than say if you're a defensive tackle at USC or anywhere else that maybe doesn't have this known commodity of themselves about the defense then you might have a little bit of a shorter leash hmm. have we seen a I haven't seen a, a college football coach draw this much immediate attention as this Eric Henderson guy out at USC has in a long time. Well, I was wondering, like, why is everybody talking about Aaron Donald all of a sudden at USC? Eric Henderson. And I was, and so I had to do the research. I yeah. was like, what the heck is going on there? Must be a hell of a coach. Must, Must be. I mean, a hell of a persona as well. Yeah. They say he's an elite, elite recruiter. And he's only been in college for two weeks. You know? <laughs> hey. It's a guy who left pro ball, took a linear job. Left pro ball to come to college football because he, in his press conference, said he wanted some of that smoke on the recruiting trail. Mm. He must be playing with fire. You know what I mean? What an anomaly in today. Like in, in the world where like we're losing coaches left and right to the NFL and guys are taking linear jobs because they don't want to recruit. Yeah. To see a guy in the NFL who's been a career NFL guy come to college and be like, what's up with all this recruiting? Let me see what's going on. Interesting. Might have been because his best player was retiring. I don't know. I mean, let's, you know, has might very been. well could have. Let's go find another. It. But I mean, he did. He did a great job at L. A. You can't. You no. can't even just yeah. point to Aaron Donald. He he had the rookie sack leader this past year. Um, they've they've done a tremendous job of coaching that position up, and he's a South or Southern Cal now, and they're they're recruiting their ass off and doing a good job. Um, I do worry about Elias being there this past weekend, but it seems like all the. Uh, Maybe all the down payments went to the defensive side of the football. <laughs> Guess what Anything else for us tonight, boys? Uh, we can hit on of, yeah, the Rams. Uh, yeah, speaking Someone's of the Rams. Someone's back. Stetson Bennett. Is that a return? He was never officially off the roster. It was worded like it was a return. Like they were like, he is going to return to practice. To action. With the yeah, team. It was kind of almost the exact same diction that they used. Yeah, it was kind of like he's – with he's on the team, he's not the with the team, right but now he's going to be with the team participating in off-season yeah. workouts. Which hell yeah, man. Because I think it all has to do with parameters around the NFI, as that was called, or the... Non-football injury list, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, Les Snead told reporters that quarterback Stetson Bennett would once again be with the team to participate in off-season workouts ahead of the 2024 schedule. Mailman is back, baby. I mean, it's reassuring because who who did the Rams just get? Garoppolo. Garoppolo. I mean, everybody was kind of wondering, like, ah, that doesn't seem like it's a good sign for Stetson. So, Is this the first time in Stetson Bennett's life where he's been talented enough to overcome a mistake? I think it's the first time in his life where people feel like he's talented enough That's what to I'm saying. overcome um, a mistake. That's what I'm saying. I mean, you could argue that 2021. How? Because you got benched in 2020 and you came back, won the starting well, I mean, job over. Daniels over. was off the roster in 2021 by that point. No, he was still on the roster. JT Daniels, JT oh, yeah, Daniels you're right. started you're right, the 2021 you're right, you're right, season. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, because we have folks saying he was going to start I mean, the Orange Bowl. To, to argue, I mean, to win the starting job over Carson Beck in that 2021, I mean, when the injury report came out that JT Daniels wouldn't start against UAB, like everyone was like, all right, Carson Beck, here we go. But I, w- I would argue that was more of JT Daniels' potential shortcomings and Stetson being the known constant commodity inside the building. What I'm talking about now is the five foot 11 third round quarterback has so much talent that an NFL organization is like, yeah, he can disappear from us from a year and we'll still pick him up next year, even though we just signed Jimmy Garoppolo for $12 million. I mean, it's, it certainly feels like not a whole lot of NFL organizations would have done that. I think that, he, And I think that's why it was a great sight to see that he went somewhere like the L.A. Rams. He went somewhere with Sean McVay. And, I mean, as soon as he got on the roster, I mean, Sean McVay and even his um, his peers around him, they spoke nothing but highly about him throughout the practice sessions that he went through, rookie training camp and everything. I mean, everybody continued to talk about how talented Stetson is and continue to believe in him. And so I think he's in a great situation for himself. And that was the biggest thing, knowing that like when guys aren't going in the first or second round, the next biggest thing you kind of shift toward is like, well, let's make sure that he's going to the best place for him and I think the LA Rams is one of the top places that he could have gone. I remember reading the quotes and not reading them, watching the video of Les and Sean talking about Stetson right after the draft and Les had this like shit eating grin on his face like we, yeah. we, we stole one. Yeah we got we, we freaking stole one. We thought this guy was a dude and we got him in the third round. Fourth, yeah, fourth, fourth round. round. Top fourth of the fourth. I think he was pick one yeah. 30 something. It was like very top of the fourth round. Yeah but, but anyway. I mean it's Hopefully he can continue to improve because, I mean, now it, you have to assume he's QB3 on that depth chart. Mm-hmm. So hopefully, you know, some. Oh, my God. He would be an elite NFL practice squad QB. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. He would be out here mimicking everybody. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. A little mini Pat Mahomes one week. <laughs> the next week he's Kurt Boring Cousins, you know. That'd be cool. Hey, now you might offend someone with that, Kirk Warren Cousins. Hey, I, I, I've been well on the record. I think Kirk's mid, and we'll end it at that tonight. So, y'all just paid a hundred million dollars for one and four in the playoffs, and <laughs> eight and twenty-five boo, in boo this man. football games. Boo this man. Hey, congrats. Yeah, but stat I mean, patter, stat patter. What that guy is. Me and Kirk O'Chain's gonna have a conversation with you later this year. Yeah, Kirk we ain't got to talk about all the cultural appropriation we got going on out here nowhere. Hey, appreciate you guys. We'll see you tomorrow. They put man's in gold teeth and chains the moment he signed.